Summer from Limer Creative, and we're talking today about case-based and problem-based uh, EMS education. This actually is a presentation uh, modified from one that I did at EMS World Expo in Las Vegas in uh, September uh, of this year. So I'm excited to be doing this, something that I'm probably the most passionate about of, of anything that I do. So that makes me very happy to, uh, you know, to be able to present this. So what is this going to be about? Well, we're going to talk obviously about case-based learning and problem-based learning, and, and the difference between those two is, is noteworthy, but sometimes they blend together as we do things. And I'll give some examples of those. Everything that I'm going to give, uh, I've given a try at least once, sometimes more. I had the good fortune to work at George Washington University with Greg Margolis and Artsia, uh, Melissa Alexander, Keith Minoski, some, some great people, and we did a problem-based program there uh, largely based after what they're doing at the medical school at George Washington. I'll talk about you know, some of that. And there are certainly some other non-traditional methods that, that come into to what we do in EMS. So that's the, that's the plan for the presentation today. I think that we've probably all done some sort of case-based learning, whether it be formal or whether it be just you know, spur of the moment kind of thing in class, just asking some questions. Problem-based learning, I think, is where we're charting the newest territory, but I, I think it's, uh, it's very worthwhile. And we'll see that if we look for a, a, definition, a definition of problem-based learning, this comes from Ohio State, one of the pioneers of uh, problem-based learning in medicine. Problem-based learning provides a framework of self-directed study from which students explore, and it creates a learning and exploration process that will last through practice. Intuitively, I'm not really sure anybody can argue with the things that are, are being said there, that um, uh, creating a learning and exploration process to last through practice is a wonderful concept to do. Um, it's a self-directed study from which students explore, I think, that causes a little bit more stress in the EMS environment. Now, when I do these presentations, there's, uh, you can you know, hopefully know that these all come from Experience. I know we have a lot of experienced educators that are in the webinar today. A lot of this presentation came about as I watched my wife Stephanie studying for an EMT class. You can see her there on the screen now. And I was watching her make study cards and go through and, and do this. She's sitting next to me and she loves when I show these photos. But <laughs> I actually watched Stephanie studying for an EMT class. It was, a, it was a fascinating thing. Having written EMT books for 20 years and been involved in EMS education, I had really never watched someone study before, especially someone who's a librarian and someone who's very, very, um, I will say, dedicated rather than retentive. And um, she really can't say anything because she's not on the webinar. So um, I watched her study, and I watched her go through things like terminology, you know, where, where she doesn't have a lot of EMS background. She's certainly been hanging around me long enough to pick a lot of it up. But this is the stuff that really became an issue, especially in the beginning, and it sets a foundation. Yet the way we teach it probably isn't the way it's best learned. You know, and we know what students do. This is anatomical Margot. I made up post-it notes with, uh, with the bones and structures of the body, and, you know, we, we played pin the tail on our daughter, and, and this is how we learn. And I know that, that you do this in class sometimes, but really, you learn better from doing this than you do from listening and, and other things. I think it's important that it's the, it's the practice that, that seems to make a difference. The other thing that really brought this about is earlier in uh, 2013, I went to uh, Hofstra University and did a presentation for North Shore Long Island uh, Jewish uh, EMS Systems uh, Instructor Coordinator Update that I did down there. They've sponsored um, several of my programs. I'm actually going to be going back down there again in the spring. And I was at the Hofstra University School of Medicine. And while I was there walking around in all the classrooms in this med school, they have a big, um, a big auditorium kind of thing, a big seating thing with all kinds of audiovisual stuff. Then they have the breakout rooms that have glass so you can see inside them. But all the rest of the room are whiteboards. And the students go in there with their assignments from their problem-based learning presentation, and they go in. And I looked at those walls, and they were writing stuff out and figuring it out and teaching. And the role of the faculty members, we'll talk about later, was more of a facilitator than it was as a, not than it was as a, as a teacher per se, like we do. And and this is something I saw on the wall: associate dean for case-based learning. Now, also down in that system, down in Long Island, they have a, a problem-based paramedic program 
I'll talk about that a little bit more, but it was fascinating talking to them and, and, and you know, seeing how that was done. Our students like to figure things out. Our students are creative generally, sometimes to the detriment of class, but they're generally creative and they want to learn. And the way that we teach probably isn't the most effective, but it's the way we teach. Now, I finished a paramedic class. I'll show you one of my students here. This is um, Casey. And I actually saw this on a Facebook page. And I came back in after seeing this on the Facebook page, and I said, Casey, I saw a picture of you on the roof of paramedic, you know, the paramedic building. And he laughed. I said, how did you get up there? And he said, well, they lifted me up. And I asked how he got down, and he said, trust fall, which almost gave me a uh, myocardial infarction. Um, and it turns out that, that he was joking. They were playing frisbee. The sheriff was also called because the frisbee was going into the road and annoyed a neighbor. So our students are, are very vibrant and active. So they're going through and looking at the, at the 12 lead. This is um, you know, Josh and KJ. And they're looking and they're shaking the leads to show artifact on the monitor, not probably on the monitor. And that's how they learn. How will they identify artifact? Well, by being able to create it in class. That's how they're going to do it. Now, this, the same group, um, Josh and KJ, decided to put the leads, two of them on Josh, the right one was on Josh, the left one was on KJ, and they had two QRS complexes. So what they did is they held hands and, and created the one EKG. Now, you might wonder exactly how this plays into education. It plays into education the fact that people will figure things out. I mean, you can judge how much they're enjoying it there. That's not anything for, you know, for me to say. I have nothing, to, nothing either way on that one. However, that's what learning is about. And that's what students do. I think it's just really, really important that we harness the spirit in case-based and problem-based learning with the proper facilitation puts us in a spot where I think this is really, really important. Now, the student in this case um, needs to be somewhat self-directed. They have to perform independent thinking. And this also owns interpersonal communication. Because you're going to put people into a group to learn things, and you're going to have one person that knows it all, or so they believe, a couple people that are worker bees, one person that's totally unmotivated, and one person that might be shy or introverted. And you get this group together, and they have to be able to work together and learn together. I think one of the things that this does is this gives our students the ability to work in a team. And I think that's vitally important that I was talking to the people on Long Island, and they said, well, you know, we, our students come in and they take a test on what they learned the previous week. And when they do this, they then go out and have coffee, and they go to breakfast, and they come back, and then we give them the problem-based learning stuff, and then they go on, and we just facilitate. I said, wow, how did that go? And I said, well, it's a little tricky in the beginning. And they also do a little bit more screening than an average program. I think that there's something to be said for that. It's like a, like a distance program. If you're teaching distance education, you know, so if you're not motivated, if you're not self-motivated, that's going to be a challenging situation to be in. And I think it's the same thing here. So we certainly have to test our students. Now, still in the, in the kind of, you know, warm-up and, and giving examples of things, I taught a class in uh, Washington State in February. And a couple of educators I talked to, and I still keep in touch with right along, listened to a presentation I did. It was, it was something like this one. And they wanted to go back and they want to integrate this. And they want to take lifespan development and work it into some of the clinical cases. And they also wanted to have people apply it to patients, but they wanted to do it over the length of the class. Now, it was wonderful to continue to be in touch with these educators as they started the class this fall and as they went through and, and used the program. And they were very kind to send me uh, some of the work. Now, the students actually created uh, the patient names. Uh, Ted Helga, uh, I've taken, uh, taken the student's name off of here. Well, here we are. Um, Pay no attention to the pre-hospital emergency care ninth edition. It's not my EMT book, but it's Mistovich's, so I'll, I'll give them a break on that one since Joe does spectacular work. And here is Ted in the age range of 61 to death, uh, which obviously is older uh, adulthood. And they were asked to do common EMS calls, social characteristics, differences in anatomy. Now look at the way this would probably normally be taught in an EMT class. This would have been taught by a series of slides in a lecture on day number three with no relevance to as things go. It's taught once, it's tested, 
And it might be referenced at certain points, but it certainly wasn't integrated. I think this is just a beautiful way to do this. Now, um, farther down on that page, you see one of the exam considerations they have and one of the vital signs ranges. So it's a two-page sheet they give out. I'll continue uh, with this. And then you, the students create a scenario. Dispatched to a 70-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the mouth. Now, any time that you give students the ability to create a scenario, it's generally going to be a winner. You know, they're not going to pick you know, general body weakness or developing dementia. They're probably going to be a big one like this. But I think it's significant because this is not an, not an unusual call with the depression and the suicide, which is, which is spiking to a certain extent in the, the geriatric population. So based on this and the scenario, I ask about the assessment and the findings as they would, as they would, would see those. Um, and then the treatment. And, you know, patient, patient died. Call the police department. And I think as I was, as I was talking to, to Kelly about this, you know, throughout the semester, she said, gee, I wonder if they're going to, I wonder if they're going to kill uh, Ted. And I said, gee, I hope they do. I thought that sounded kind of, kind of cruel. But think about it now. This gives you the ability to talk about what his wife feels there at the scene, the concept of death and dying, sudden death versus long-term death, and all these things, I think are really amazing. So just with this simple thing that was done every so often as you, as you move through the class, this sheet, it's a way that you can do a case-based, even a little bit of problem-based education, rather than just do the lecture on, uh, on the lifespan development. I think that it's just you know, very, very uh, cool. I saw that I moved 16% towards hot, and then I lost it again. I'm not quite sure what happened there, but I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that. So, uh, again, feel free to throw something in the chat or uh, use the Q&A question uh, as we go. It will, uh, you know, will be, uh, will be good to see. So, all right, the educator in this problem-based and case-based thing really should function as a facilitator or a guide. The educator sets expectations. Uh, it works really to improve communication and, and help them solve problems, not necessarily solve the problems themselves, the interpersonal problems or the, work, or the clinical problems, quite frankly. And then the assessment that the educator does from the outside um, is of the student's engagement. That if you had people break up into groups and the educator you know, came into the room, you'd be looking to see who's engaging and who's learning and, and who's coasting and, and who's doing what. And the facilitator would hopefully get everyone into the game although the group would be expected, I think, to some extent um, to police itself. Now we've talked about the general concept of problem-based learning. We've been able to talk about that, that general concept. Um, I'm just going to pose the, the big question here. Now I'll ask you to, to hop into the, the chat room, is that can this work? Now I recognize I might be preaching to the choir. I know I've got some very dynamic educators in the room, but, but can this work? You know, have you tried this? Do you believe this is working? Are you here only to, to, to find out that it won't work, or, or can this work? What do you guys think? I'm going to, I'm going to take a peek at the chat room as I, as I move the, the slides here, but I think that this is an important question. I believe that it can work myself, but it's very challenging to do. So any, any thoughts you have, any experiences? Um, John has said, the key is the students need to do work before coming to class. And I think, that's a, I think that's a good point because some of this stuff can be done anywhere. This might be individual work that's done or it might be group work outside of class. When we were at George Washington, the students were expected to meet sometime out of class to be able to do some of the work to come back in and do the report. And I think that that's, that's significant. The students have to be able to take an assignment to a certain extent uh, and run with it. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's important. Uh, really, the students, um, they've done a few things like this in their class, and the students have said it helps them retain info better. I think that's a really great point, that the students like to be involved, and when they apply it, I think educationally, we'll all agree that they will learn it better. But there certainly are some challenges and, and risks you know, when, we, when we do this. So I think those are good points. I did a, a class, uh, Mark Minkler is on the, is on the line here, and we both were teaching at Southern Maine. Well, I think it was technical college at the time before it became a community college. And I took a very case-based approach to a medical emergencies class. And I got through the first couple of weeks. I was really excited. The students were learning. Oh, it was really great. And uh, I said, okay, there's a test next week. Any questions? And one of them raised their hand and said, well, you didn't teach us anything. What's on the test? 
I would have told them that they learned better than if they were listening to me because they were actually case-based stuff and looking at detailed references was really great, you know, but they wondered you know, what the test was going to be on. So I think there's a certain amount of structure that we provide, um, but I really do believe that this is a much, much better way to learn, you know, to, to do it uh, actively. If you're looking at, uh, at doing this, um, is, is you don't have to do it all at once. Uh, Rosalie just commented the hard part is being uh, creative enough to think of the exercises and put them into play. And that goes perfectly um, with this slide. You have to be committed to start, and you don't have to do it at once. It is a lot of work. You know, it, it really is to get this ready. Now, I would say, rather than saying, gee, I'm starting a class in January, and I'm going to make it a totally problem-based EMT class. No, I'm not sure that's the best move. I think that by doing that, um, Williams is trying to put it in his classes, I think that's a, a great way to, to do it. Um, you don't have to do it all at once. But what happens is, is the students will try and back you down. They're going to they're gonna push back. Like with me, they said, what's going to be on the test? You didn't teach us anything. It would be easy for me to say, oh, gee, they're not learning anything. But I really do think they were learning something. Um, Mark, Mark commented here, and with another comment I agree with, uh, group work encourages those that wish to excel to lead and run the group and those that typically coast to hide behind them. Uh, and I think that's true. Uh, I think that we see that in any group we do. Uh, anything that we do, we see that if we have, you know, six people on two crews that are, you know, doing something. I don't care if it's getting a lunch order together or doing a project around the station. It's going to be the exact same dynamic depending on the people that come together. I think it's our job as facilitators to try and get people in the game and also for people in the group to be able to, you know, to deal with that as well. But the students will definitely try and back you down, you know. They'll, and, you know, one side of their, their mouth, you know, this is the angel and the devil on the shoulder. The one side is going to say, oh, this is really so exciting. And the other one is, is, well, you're not teaching me anything. So I think that we have to, we have to come up with a, with a way to, to let the students know they're learning and learning better. We're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, as we go on. Um, that the teamwork involves obviously sharing in the interpersonal relations, obviously dealing with different level of knowledge and engagement. I think that, that on top of what Mark talked about, about people being engaged, there's going to be pretty, you know, people with different levels of knowledge. And that, in that photo I showed you, um, one of the students was, was pre-med. And the other guy was kind of came up, you know, as an explorer through the fire service and stuff, but a really sharp guy. They were the number one, number two people in the class. And I think there's some people that I probably wouldn't have to teach a lot to, and they'd go take the exam, and they would probably figure it out. You know, how to make it work for everyone is certainly a challenge. But I think what everyone's saying there in the chat is that beneficial isn't always easy. This takes some work, and I think more importantly, it takes some risk. So in that regard, I believe it's beneficial, um, but it's not easy. Um, John made a great comment. One of the things that I'm learning is that I need to hold on to the answers rather than offer them up too quickly when the, when the students seem stumped. Because if the students hear you say, this is the answer, they're going to take that, and it's like chilling it in the stone tablet, like this is exactly what the answer is. But there are often shades of gray in EMS, and if the students expect it handed to them, they never learn the shades of gray. They never get the, the maybes of EMS you know, that I really think are, are vitally important in, into, into what our education does and, and what we're teaching. I mean, it's just, it's just, I think it's really that important. So let me look quickly at case-based learning. And case-based learning might be ultimate cases, or it could be a series of cases. One of the distinctions that we'll make here is that, that case-based learning is similar to problem-based learning. I think that that's you know, safe to say. It can, they both can be longitudinal, although problem-based learning is often uh, longitudinal more than, than case-based, but certainly they, they both can be. We often look at case-based as giving students a, a case in class, they solve the case, and they're done. But it could be a multi-step case, or could these cases could actually be following the patient through a lifespan, and with that you're going through and doing that. Problem-based learning will ask students probably to apply physiology more and to get to a deeper level of understanding where case-based does more simple application. 
So, case-based learning. Cases allow students to safely apply knowledge to real situations before they get in the street. Uh, it stimulates thinking and decision making. As educators, we can take that and run with it. Remember the concept of the teachable moment. That if you can get a student to look confused at you and raise their hand and ask a question, that's a teachable moment. Some people call them aha moments because when students ask a question, that response, they're open to getting and to learning and to applying. And these case-based scenarios can create those aha moments. And I think that it's, that it's really, really important, the thinking and decision-making that it can do and, and help us deal with some of the grades. Our students are breaking up on black and white. It's one of the reasons they go nuts on the registry exam when they're given all the answers which seem right or all the answers which don't seem right. They have trouble picking out the least sucky answer, which quite frankly is a lot about what EMS in the street is. And to do a case base, you want to put them all on paper. You don't need an awful lot of equipment or anything. Um, and I think that, that it's good to stimulate discussion and teamwork. I think it's, uh, it's vitally important. Um, Mark has a good question here. As an educator, do you have specific goals for each PBL um, case? Uh, do you let the students run with it and risk not hitting all the topics? Well, I think you have to have at least a broad stroke guide to it. I'm going to show you later um, ways that you can create patients that will cover a lot of the stuff that you do. I think as much of an issue as Mark says, not hitting all the topics, it's obviously our responsibility as educators to make sure that all the topics are covered. Uh, Bill Brown, who does the ENT Pass App for us, calls, uh, calls some of the way students learn, like Swiss cheese. They learn a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of holes in it. And it's our responsibility to make sure those holes are covered. So if you are planning on the PBL to cover everything, then you have to carefully monitor it to make sure. Most people use PBL as a portion of the education and then supplement it with, with lecture to make sure they kind of hit all the topics. And I think that's, I think that's significant. Um, I'll also say that it often can be asymmetrical as well. And that's coming up in another slide here. That what often can be challenging when we plug it into our schedule and making sure we're hitting everything as we look at education standards and objectives that it might not be in the order that we're used to, and I think that's also uh, a part of the situation. So case-based presentation might work like this. You present a case. I often uh, present the cases incrementally so you can kind of narrow the focus and you can get them to think. Those are you know, relatively good in the beginning. The students drive the learning in that case. That discussion is really important. I think that, you know, students get in that class. I think educators are like, all oh, those students are talking, you know, you know, are they? If they're talking about EMS stuff, I think it's great. I mean, really, we don't get that, and the students kind of have to drive how that goes. We facilitate. We make sure they get the depth. We sometimes go through and, and refocus the questions. You say, well, what you get? Here's a case. You have a paragraph there, and you've asked three questions based on the case, and you sit down on the chair and meet with the students in the group, and you say, well, you got it. And they kind of tell you the general gist, and you say, well, I think one, you got nailed. Two, you need some more depth. If you're on a call, would that really be enough? If you get a report to the hospital, and you went through and asked for an order for something, would you have enough? You know, so I think steering those things is really, really important. That's our part of our facilitation. But remember, these can be inside class and outside of class, and that's, uh, that's important uh, as well. So if you were to break this up you know, incrementally like we talked about, you might do part one, which is the complaint. You know, what does the complaint mean to the student? When you see the, the patient, what's their general impression, helping, you know, focus those things? The initial uh, assessment and uh, the history and physical exam, determining what science and facts are necessary to understand the disease process, and that's where you can cross somewhat into problem-based learning, is by having them figure those things out. Like I said, I was so impressed just watching this room that had three walls that were whiteboards. You know, that were dry erase boards, and all the things that were written on there, and all the things that students were working through, taking this complex patient. I remember a lot of it was about diabetes, and talked about how, you know, glucose metabolism, and it was obviously at a med school level, but they were really working, and it was just so exciting just watching it and thinking, you know, what they did. The diagnosis, um, part four, which I think is vitally, I think, we screw up more in part four on the screen there than we do in part five. We think of, we take a lot of our, our errors in their procedural or their medication administration. I think a lot of our errors are diagnostic. 
I think many times we apply the wrong protocols uh, to patients because we blew the diagnosis, that we haven't taught a differential diagnostic process. And this is the spot of the part of the case where you can take that differential diagnostic process uh, and, and make it work. And then, of course, we do have to talk about management. Many times it's, it's protocol driven. We have a paramedic clash of people in different regions or depending on where you are, sometimes different states. You know, many times paramedic classes take a theoretical basis and say, you know, what's this, you know, what's this about? I just pegged the hot skin. You guys just made me very happy. I hope that's not Stephanie sitting over there doing that. So, oh, I'm back. So, don't forget things like social issues, uh, prevention, and think about the concept of expanded scope as you do these things. You won't be teaching that in your medical class. You wouldn't have tons of time, um, or even an EMT class, quite frankly. But when you think about the expanded scope and the, the community paramedics, or even EMTs going out there and doing some prevention and making a difference, that when you think about that and putting a perspective on it, what can EMS do now to help their patients that's not cool EMS stuff? What kind of stuff can we do? How can we think to prevent injuries? How can we think to, to keep this patient from calling back repeatedly because they're lonely? That social issues and prevention are a part of EMS. I think we should embrace these things in our classes. It doesn't have to be uh, a separate class. Early cases uh, may be scenario-based and sometimes during the early part of the, of the curriculum. You know, safety, ethical issues, transport issues, and lifting and moving. You can do cases really for anything. I think ethical cases can be fun. I mean, you can have some, some great uh, discussions uh, in doing that. So the early cases and then later cases you know, try and work complaint-based. That's the way patients present. And they don't always have to match the chapter that you're currently working on in class. You know, I think that you can, that you can do a little before, a little bit after students look ahead in the book, um, at least the ones that look at the book. Uh, later cases allow us to think about, you know, comorbidities. You know, what happens when a um, hyperglycemic uh, patient, a type 2 diabetic, gets the flu? You know, what happens when someone changes their blood pressure medication? You know, all those things are really, really important. It lets us, you know, recognize things. Uh, altered mental status at the skilled nursing facility, you know, could be any number of things, including uh, the talk online today I was talking about sepsis. So, you know, you can build these things. And if you've been out there practicing at any time or, or if your students are coming back in and turning in forms, you have plenty of opportunities to come up with, you know, with different case studies. So an example of an early case study I used in my, in my paramedic program, I apologize for the big slide here. I'll just read this to you. I'll paraphrase and I'll go through and show you the next ones. Basically, I built a case about a 67-year-old guy who's got respiratory distress. It's a safe scene. He's tripoding three to four word sentences, pinning edema, blah, blah, blah. Get the whole case. He's a 60-pack year smoking guy. You get the picture, and I mean, you've seen this, this guy before, I'm sure. So then I say, for the following parts of the medical focus history and physical exam, which kind of old terms, we really should be calling it you know, a secondary assessment or you know, a history and physical exam that focused stuff that came from the 1994 MTB curriculum was kind of crap. I guess I can say that because it's my webcast. The, um, find the relevance and diagnostic value of the following findings if you observe them in the patient. No, not all findings are found simultaneously. Then I give them this list. Well, if the patient's got fever, I guess ascites, productive cough, pulse ox number, he's on oxygen if he takes these meds, if he doesn't comply with his meds. He's taking all these things individually. Now, you could take a group and, and you know, people and you could give them this, and this can be an EMT level kind of thing because they hear these things and they have no idea what the relevance of them are. So they go through and say, oh, it's got a fever, it might be an infection, could be, you know, well, viral respiratory infection exacerbates COPD. They can go through and they can come up with these things. Again, case-based, kind of problem-based. If you have, don't have a lot of time and you have a class with, you know, 16, 20 people and you break them up into four or five groups, cut these into quarters and give some to each group and then have them give a report about what it means. The key, though, is if they miss the point and you add to it, or you hone the information they give and give it the clinical relevance because they're going to see the patient you saw there. You know they're going to find the flemmer, you know, the, the old smoker having respiratory stress. He's going to be one of their patients. And they're going to see many of these things, sometimes most of these things in a patient, but they won't know what it means. 
So I think things like this as an early case, I use this in my paramedic class, but I think this is totally fair game from the MP class, is to build a patient picture and take all these signs and symptoms and tell them what they mean. So they're doing the history. They're not doing it from some sense of, of, of rote. They're doing this from a sense of, of knowledge because you give it to them in the class in a very practical approach. And even if you're not teaching those medications and even if they don't know about atrial fibrillation, they're going to hear it. And they want to know intuitively inside so they can talk to their patients and know what to say. So I think that's a, that's a really good thing to do. Case-based errors. Sometimes we make our cases uh, not the best they can be. I call them poorly designed. They might be too easy. The sequence might not flow. Sometimes they're impossible to solve. I like to give something that's eventually solvable. It can certainly be challenging. And there's times we go to a nook and cranny and make them really reach and try and think of it. That's okay. But I think we have to give our students the ability to succeed. And if they constantly are looking for traps and if they're constantly getting things that they don't know without a point, I think that's a problem. And again, like I said, the French topics. You know, throw in some zebras sometimes towards the end of the class, some challenging things. But really have a purpose, have an endpoint that the students can get to and learn from, and then you will bring it home uh, in, your, in your lecture. Um, thank you, uh, Rosalie. That's, that's a, that was one of my fun ones. To get people started, you know, students will dig into that stuff. What I do when I give students my case studies when I'm doing a class, I have two milk crates. And I have, you know, Rosen's Emergency Medicine and Harrison's Internal Medicine, and I'll have a couple of journals, or I'll have, um, you know, Bates Physical Exam, or I'll have stuff and, you know, I'll have references with me. So I put them on the table, and students grab them, and they take them, and they look at them, and it's a hoot. I mean, they really, uh, they really enjoy that. It's, uh, it's quite the thing. Now, one of the things I've been talking about for a long time is asymmetry. A lot of people see chapter one and chapter two and chapter three and chapter four right through to chapter 38, and that's the order that it goes in. But really, if you're going to start doing stuff, there's mild asymmetry where you do pediatric respiratory distress in the respiratory distress chapter, I think that's really good. Or you do something that's totally different. You're in an airway and somebody turns out that you're ventilating somebody and they have a they have an MI and they and they start to go downhill. I say, oh, they don't know what an MI is. Well they watch television enough and you know what? They can flip back to chapter 17 and figure it out. It's okay. You don't want to make it crazy. The students need to know what's being taught. They need to have reading assignments, you know, to go ahead and do that stuff. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing you can talk about. It also doesn't mean you can't go ahead to something and mention it briefly and have the students become familiar with it in an important context. You know, I think that's really uh, important to do. So you can be somewhat asymmetrical with different levels, and you're going to have to look at your schedule. This goes back to Mark question, Mark's question. He talked about you know, goals for each PBL session. And so the case that the students go at, and what happens if you don't hit the topics? Well, the other, other option to that is what happens if they hit a topic that's not part of that class? Well, you've got to make sure that you keep track of it. So you can make sure that that class, you take a little bit less time and, and are aware of what's going on. So that, that's, uh, so that's important. So I want to talk about a more comprehensive approach now. This was, I think we called this problem-based learning. I think it was a little bit case-based, but I think that it had a problem-based component to it. When we were at George Washington, we put together a series of patients. So this is the exact group of patients. It's things I've been working on here. And we have a newborn, a child with asthma, uh, a child and an adult patient with special needs, a pregnant woman, a man who's developing coronary artery disease and becoming sicker, and then a geriatric patient developing dementia. Now, these program patients, the students will follow from the beginning of class. And you should name your patients and get a picture of them. It might be from your family album. It might be, you know, I can't tell you to take things from the Internet, but that's kind of what we do. And put a picture and a name with the patient and then give them things. So you may have this pregnant woman on your screen there. That's the fourth bullet. And you may start with her and work A and P in with that and do those things, it will be great. And then she becomes, she delivers the baby, and the newborn becomes a second patient. So you go through and you build that stuff, and then the newborn is your second patient. 
So then the child with asthma can start as, as a young child and can, can gradually grow up and deal with the asthma. The child or adult with special needs, and we'll see later, might be a patient who crashed uh, his car or his motorcycle and had a head injury that becomes a special needs patient, and then talk about risk factors and talk about you know, why people are injured and killed in trauma as part of their patient. And then imagine watching someone getting sicker and sicker, having increased exertional problems, maybe having some diabetes or hypertension. And then the geriatric patient developing dementia, not only do you have complaints for altered mental status and things that need to be done, you also have the familial issues. You have when he's found wandering around the neighborhood or in the supermarket and doesn't know where he is. You know, those things happen all the time. So I talked a little about the stuff that I'm going to do, but you follow these patients for a period of time. It can be days to years. Now, these are like their dog years, right? These are class years. A patient can age any amount of time between classes. You may have the, the pregnant woman who goes through her pregnancy over a period of five or six weeks. But then from that, she will have the baby, and that baby will, will also be born. And that can take up an entire semester just by going through that case. But not all of these things have to be done every week. That these patients that we, they straddle several weeks, and we might not hear from them for a while, and then they'll be back. But your students will, your students will call by name. I mean, this can be an amazing thing. It's so much fun you know, to do. And then don't forget the illnesses, the well care, social issues, prevention, all the things that can come up in this. Ted, the patient from, uh, from Kelly's class in Washington State, died. He had committed suicide. Well, you know what? That stuff is, is, is from lifespan development and geriatrics. It's from trauma because it's a gunshot wound. It's from psych emergencies because it's depression and having those things. There is so much to learn. It's asymmetrical, but it's applied. I mean, it's really, really amazing. So give your patients names and lives and, and a satiric photo. Uh, create different ethnic backgrounds for your patients. Give them, give them names and, and photos and lifestyles and issues that, that happen with, with the patients of that, of that background. And that way we can have both clinical and affective issues uh, with these patients. So take our newborn. The newborn um, may have a developmental issue of some kind. It doesn't have to be big. You know, it might be a, just a little uh, ventricular septal defect that the parents are worried about. And then talk about how you would, you know, if a parent was concerned and they called you, how would you deal with a parent with those concerns? Those things are really amazing. But how the, the baby often has a certain amount of health and they progress. How much weight do they gain? How much do they grow? What's going on cognitively? Injury prevention, you know, our kids fall into buckets of water and, and drown. You know, what's the, what are the issues that we might be able to prevent? how the parents adjust to it. There might be some tension between the parents and the house. And then let's throw in some type of illness that happens to kids, like an RSV infection. A uh, child with asthma, acute and chronic progression, the pathophysiology, medication compliance, social issues. You know, the things that can happen as a child grows up uh, with asthma. Some people grab it. Some people have it for their, for their entire lives. What happens if they can't use their inhaler? You know, all these things are just right for us to learn from. I mean, it's really, really amazing what we can do. The special needs patient we talked about can be a healthy patient, a head injury causes a sudden change. That change causes certain family dynamics, the devices that the patient needs then, and their other needs. And then what happens when UMass is called? We have a head injury facility here in Kennebunk that you go to. It's, you know, they, they take you know, good care of people and they try and do rehabilitation, but it's very sad you knowing these people had been functional before their head injury and seeing the effects of it really are, are very sad. And I think that we can take that and we can put it into the class um, and make uh, a significant difference in our, in our students' education uh, by doing that. All right, the pregnant woman. How about infertility before she gets pregnant? Learn about the, the female reproductive system, but frankly, the male reproductive system, male infertility issues are probably much more than were ever anticipated. It was always looked at as a female thing, but there are probably more male components than were ever realized. She may have had a miscarriage before. Talk about the pregnancy and what prenatal care does, what the lack of prenatal care will be. And then go through the process of childbirth. And at that point, your newborn patient can begin we don't forget about the pregnant woman who she may have postpartum depression. You know, and then she'll go on and, and, and be a parent as this, as this child 
uh, grows older as well as a potential patient herself. Man with coronary artery disease, lifestyle issues, develops a disease, what happens? Well, people who find out that they're hyperglycemic or hypertensive, they ignore their chest pain for a while. I mean, can, I hope that you're seeing in here the things that you can develop. Now, if I were to take and, and I were to put this into an EMT class, I would take these patients and I would put them out on a schedule over however long you have your students. And I would take and I would make a list of all the topics you want to cover and where they fit in your schedule. Again, going back to Mark's question about why am I hitting all the topics? And then map out what you have covered and what you haven't covered as you do this. Because it doesn't always have to be on the night you cover some. You don't have to do the, the artery disease on the night that you're doing cardiac. You know, it just, because that certainly applies to respiratory, and it applies to a lot of other things as well. Chest pain incident, maybe he goes in and gets a stent. Maybe the, the 12 lead uh, and the CAS5 activation works for him. And he has intervention and uh, goes through rehab, and we get to look at the prognosis and what that means. Because your, your students, whether they're EMTs or paramedic, are going to find patients like this that have had a stent put in, now they're having chest pain again. And they should know all these things. If they can apply it themselves, I just think it would be amazing for them to do. All right, we're getting to our, our geriatric patient um, with dementia. And in this, um, evaluation of events uh, during development of dementia, because dementia is different um, than, than other types of, uh, of mental status uh, changes. How does the patient first get into the system? But it doesn't mean that the first couple weeks of this patient couldn't be stuff that's going on at home that you don't see. Because that stuff is okay. The wife is finding he's more forgetful. Maybe he's getting a little bit belligerent and she's afraid he's being too aggressive and wonders if she can take care of him. All these things are totally valid because they're, you're, you know patients are going to be telling these same things to your student and your student might be able to have experienced them already by doing things like this. Ongoing dynamics, the medical and the, and the family, anybody who's had a relative like this goes in and out. If you're in a facility, we're carrying these people back and forth for things that, that you know, might not even be solvable. You know, we talked about the subsequent EMS calls. The patient falls. They get lost. They get hypothermic. They go lock themselves out of the house and hypothermic. They're found wandering in the neighborhood. I mean, as a cop, I pull people over, and they've had no clue where they are. We've had to get help for them. You know, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. So if we were to look at now how to put this in a different perspective, look at this a different way, let's look at what class weeks might be like. The man with coronary artery disease has some chest, some chest discomfort at work. Doesn't do anything about it, but he's got it. Think of the questions you can ask about that. What's caused this? Why has it built up? What are his risks? Female is diagnosed with endometriosis. Talk about abdominal pain. Talk about, you know, pelvic pain. Talk about um, anything from, from dysmenorrhea to the female reproductive system. And the dementia patient starts to concern the family. So we give these cases out. And you might be able to look at these things, spend an hour in class, or students are doing some research and you can talk to them, know that there's going to be some work outside of class. Then the next week when you come in, you talk about the first week stuff, and you give them some time to work on week number two. New patient. Child has an asthma attack. First time we've seen this patient. The female with infertility experiences depression. And the young male, the future special needs patient, begins to exhibit risky behavior. So some new and some repeat patients from week one to week two. And week number three, another asthma attack. Well, chronic versus um, acute. Everyone says, you know, oh, uh, asthma is not a COPD because it's it's acute, not chronic. Well, actually, it kind of is chronic because the mucus builds up if it's not taken care of. The patient needs steroids, not managing it properly. So you can bring those things in and relate it to pharmacology. You can relate it to pathophysiology. You can relate it to anatomy and physiology with the, with the bronchioles and the mucus production and the, and the muscles that line the airways. The coronary artery disease guy goes in, oh, blood glucose 302. And I find that why he's not being so much. Why is he always so thirsty? You know, he's overweight, he's eating. And then the dementia patients kind of confuse the supermarket, EMS is called. And then, so you can take your patients and just build them out any way that you want. 
You can have less patients, more patients, less appearances, more appearances, and take and put these into your EMP class really any way that you'd like to or into your paramedic class. Our EMT classes are considerably less hours than paramedic. But I think that the paramedic class certainly can, can use this stuff and learn. I think our students are really expecting that they're going to have to learn a lot of different things at one time. It's sometimes challenging to keep track of what you do, like I said, as far as what topics you're hitting and, and what you're doing. But I just think that it's amazing, uh, quite frankly, the, the way this uh, can be done. I'm just going to ask um, for the chat. We're kind of winding down now. It's 2, uh, 2.49. I'd like to keep these things for to less than an hour. Uh, but any thoughts you guys type in the, the chat, I'd love to, uh, to discuss uh, or address as we, as we go through those last uh, couple of slides now on here. So when students present the work, it might be verbal or it could be written. Sometimes it's both. Hard to tell. I think it's important to set some official requirements and have some expectations that are set that when students are turning in work, if it's written, it's not just going to be a couple of sentences. It's going to be a certain format, whether it be an outline or paragraph uh, or uh, anything else. And then there's often requires some type of presentation uh, to a group um, with facilitation. So I think that when students present to the group, I think that's one way to keep them on track because they don't want to sound um, like, they're a, like they're a problem. And you could give different patients in different groups and they give reports and that's, that's the way that that's teaching. And then you facilitate that. So I think that's good. Um, John just put a question up here. I think it's great. Do you grade these? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can create a, a rubric uh, for these. You know, we often don't use the, the rubric um, system. You know, if you have a, you know, 100 points and you have, you know, 20 points for presentation, 20 points for accuracy, 20, you know, for group effort, and, you're, you're, and then within each step of the, each part of the rubric, you define what each thing looks like. You can certainly set uh, a rubric, and I think that's a very valid uh, thing, John. It's a great idea. I think many times when people don't create the rubric, what they do is they grade lightly for the first couple of weeks to set the expectations properly. Um, and I think that's a more of an unofficial way to do it. I think a rubric is, uh, is good. But remember that we can do that, but the only way that we keep those expectations from the rubric is if we, if we grade accordingly and then we grade um, fairly. Um, and thanks. I'm glad that... Uh, this is giving some ideas for your class. I mean, it really is, uh, it's just great to watch the students do it. Now remember, there's some anxieties with the students, especially with this last slide here. Um, test them. You have to test them on the stuff they do. I think it's really, really important that this stuff has got to be tested. Now you can test the cologne um, or as part uh, of the class, but it's very important you test. I really believe that the most significant thing we can do Take this even out of the PPL and the, and the case-based approach. The best way you can get your students to learn is to make hard tests. You know, they will rise to whatever bar you set, or they will settle at the low bar that you set. It's totally up to you. But testing sets the expectation for learning and involvement. Don't hold back on the testing. That's one of the things they said about the, the program in Long Island, is that it took a couple weeks, you know, three, four weeks, for the students to really figure out what was going to be expected of them and what it was. Many times we back down before that happens because it's taken us out of our comfort zone. Keep the expectations high and keep the testing expectations high um, however you do that. You know, I think that's really, really important. Um, Mark says that he thinks that one could include um, how to document uh, this part of uh, case-based learning and the students should have examples on how to document the call. And I think that's right. I think that if we um, as you see what Kelly did, she created a form, and what she did was just to follow a patient to the lifespan. Did some lifespan development, did some other stuff. It was just kind of a way to introduce things. It was a wonderful start to doing this, and I think they might even try to go a little bit deeper next time. I love when I do one of these things, and then people come back and say, hey, I tried that, and this is what happened. I was able to actually give you an example this time. It was really exciting um, to see that. So yes, I agree. Um, giving examples uh, as a way to do it. I think it's really about setting the expectations. I think we also have to, to tell students that they are learning. How much structure we put to that, well, I guess that's, I guess that's, really, uh, I guess that's really kind of the, kind of the question uh, here. So that is my uh, spiel on case-based and problem-based learning. You know, I do a lot of these things. 
it's kind of an overview. A lot of the implementation and, and things that go on uh, are up to you, and there's a lot of ways to do it. Well, I talked about some pitfalls and things that can go on. I wouldn't expect anyone to go out and do this and have a perfect presentation. I just wouldn't expect it to go out there and say, it's going to go out there and it's going to sail right off the bat. And it could, but depending on your students and depending on your schedule and depending on the amount of time you have to put into it, start in a practical way and, and, and just do it passionately. And students, I think, follow passion. I think that if you ask people what they thought about their educators and who was the best, and I've seen you know, some of the people on this, on this webinar um, teaching, um, and they follow passion. They, they follow people that, that believe in EMS, they believe in learning, and people that expect you to learn. And I think that's just a great way to go. And I think it's a great way um, probably to, to wind down uh, this call. Those of you on here that, that know me, which is obviously the majority of you guys, know that I certainly can uh, chat a little bit. So I'm Dan Lemmer from Lemmer Creative. This is a case-based and problem-based learning. My email is on here. Uh, drop me a note if you have any thoughts uh, or questions. Um, thank you guys. You guys are, are, are thanking me here. And I thank you guys for being here. I can sit in my, my house and I can do these things. It's, uh, it's great to do it. And I think that this shows what you can do on a distance education basis. You guys, so we're communicating. We've got the chat going. Um, we're, we're doing things like this. Um, and I think that it's great. I think this could be a great part of distance education as well as case-based and problem-based uh, stuff. So again, for Dan Limmer and also for uh, my, my boss here, Stephanie, uh, and uh, Lulu, the corporate dog, um, I thank you all for uh, attending this. I'm going to stop the recording now, but I'll be in the chat here for a little bit. And I thank you very much for attending, and I wish you the best as you try and implement these things. Uh, please keep in touch with me um, as you do. I'd love to know how it goes. Thank you.